All right, what are you seeing now? It's your screen. I just got probably hit the slideshow button on the bottom. You're not seeing it as a slideshow? No. Do you see my whole screen or do you just see the? You stop sharing actually. Yeah. I stop sharing? Oh God. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get through this, I promise. Hold on. There we go. Yeah, it looks good. Good. OK. Except that now I can't mute myself. Hold on. Oops. All right, are you are you still seeing it, but not as a slide show? Yeah. Okay, all right, just give me one second to just mute myself and then I'll make it a slideshow and you can go ahead and start. Um, I think if someone else is a presenter, they can mute you remotely so you don't have to click in between screens. Yep, I can do it right now. Here you go. Okay. Okay, it looks like we're all ready to go. And with uh, Dean Halpin muted, I'll uh, just uh, say uh, one or two words very quickly to kick off the show and I'll pass it to, uh, to Mo Migahari. Um, and the uh, two things that I wanna say are first, uh, to thank uh, Lieutenant Colonel Andy Swedlow for uh, meeting with us and, and talking with us today. Um, Mo will give more on his bio in just a minute, but um, given the wealth of his experience, um, his deployment in very difficult and challenging places around the world, we have a lot to learn from the Lieutenant Colonel and we're very fortunate to have this opportunity today. So I extend my personal thanks to him. Um, and uh, the other thanks that I wanna give just to open this up is, is to Mo Megahari and his team of students that are working this semester through the National Security Fellowship Program on uh, the great game and terrorism and exploring these issues in more depth. Um, in the spirit of no good deed uh, goes unpunished, last night Mo sent me an email talking about how great the students did in their last uh, kind of run through to their formal presentations next week. And of course, this was great to hear. I would expect nothing less from the National Security Fellowship Program. But the reply Mo got well, from me was, hey, that's great. Can we set up a time that they can present and share their their uh, their work with the school diplomacy uh, community? Because um, I think our, our fellow students will really be impressed with the work that our students, I know I'm impressed every year with the work of the National Security Fellowship Program. So I wanna thank Mo for leading it and for all the, the students who are on the call who are members of that team. We really look forward not only to the presentation by Lieutenant Colonel Swedlow now, but also to your presentation at some point you know, hopefully we can get that scheduled over the next, uh, you know, few weeks or, or month um, before the semester ends. So congratulations and thanks to all of you. And I'm going to turn it over to Mo to begin the formal program. So thank you, Mo. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, I wanted to welcome uh, Colonel Andrew Swedlow for, to Seton Hall and the Seton Hall community. This isn't his first engagement with us. Uh, the year two of the fellowship 
Uh, our students actually did a project for him when he was at U.S. Army Africa and did a great job. And he's been involved with our program. And uh, when I brought up the conversation and the topic that we're researching this year, uh, he I asked him if he would do a talk. And uh, I think this is going to be very interesting and very insightful for everybody. Uh, I'm going to let our two student leads, Caroline Hall and Rebecca Blazer, take over. So Caroline will be introducing you and looking forward to the talk. Hi everyone, um, thank you for attending this talk. So a little bit about our presenter today, Lieutenant Colonel Andy Spudlow of Lynchburg, Virginia. He's a 21 year veteran of US Army Intelligence. He's served in a variety of units, conventional infantry, special ops and intelligence units. He spent over a quarter of his career overseas doing a tour in Kosovo, one in Afghanistan, three in Iraq, one in Kuwait and most recently two years in Italy. He has extensive knowledge and experience in the Middle East and Africa. He's a bachelor's in science and criminal justice from Radford University and a master's of science from the Naval Postgraduate School in defense analysis and irregular warfare. He's a graduate of the Humanitarian Assistance Response Training, Joint Cyberspace Operational Planners Course, Army Integrated Joint Special Technical Operations Planners Course, and multiple other op Army and intelligence courses. So on behalf of the School of Diplomacy and everyone attending, we'd like to welcome Lieutenant Colonel Andy Swedlow and really appreciate his time today. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, Elizabeth Moe, again, thank you for inviting me to do this and helping to set this up. So after uh, Mo told me about the uh, presentation that you guys were building uh, on terrorism, I figured I'd draw a comparison to a historical uh, time frame that was really familiar to me based on the time that I spent in Italy because all that history was uh, close at hand. So what we're, I'm gonna talk about is terrorism uh, during the time of the great game and nation state use of it and kind of compare it to what's going on current day. Next slide, please. All right, so what we're gonna talk through is, uh, like I said, is how nation states use terrorism. We're talking about the current environment, uh, how the, what the great game was at time in history and then give some examples of some use of terrorism by nation states during that time. And then I'll go ahead and round up and we'll uh, round it up and then we'll let you guys ask some questions that hopefully I can answer. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, so the current environment we're dealing with right now. So the main competitors we have in the world for the United States is Russia and China. So over the last 10 years, Russia has been competing with the United States on the world stage. We had them, uh, their incursion into Crimea, which they've done before, approximately 150 years before they had tried to do this. We had, in the, during the last four years, the Russians uh, putting bounties on American soldiers' heads in Afghanistan. And then we had a Russian misinformation campaign here in the United States uh, using social media and other things to cause unrest and mistrust of government institutions within the United States. We've also had uh, a modern China, which is a relatively new power. I know it's been around for thousands of years, but it, uh, emerging onto the world stage has been since the end of World War II. So China has been trying to gain influence throughout the world through its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, mainly in Africa and Europe, but also elsewhere using large economic investments in infrastructure and other types of projects that gain influence with nations throughout the world. China has also been increasingly aggressive towards its neighbors. It is uh, just this week, I think they had some uh, some military jets fly over uh, over Taiwan. They've been aggressive towards Vietnam and other people, uh, other nations within that region, trying to test responses and, and see how far they can go. Next slide, please. Now, while most people are really familiar with, uh, with Russia and China, there's also another player trying to emerge and trying to gain some credibility on the world stage. So the, th that's Turkey. So Turkey's been trying to reassert itself in a lot of its former Ottoman uh, territories. So there's been a lot of news about them backing Islamist groups in Libya and uh, against Russian back and uh, Egyptian and Saudi backed groups in Libya. They've also had some contentious issues with Greece in Greece territory, Greek territorial waters over mineral extraction and other types of economic issues. They've also had lots of military incursions in northern Iraq, including setting up a base in northern Iraq and then going after uh, Kurdish, uh, what they would consider Kurdish terrorists in northern Iraq. And then confrontations with Russian and, Sy Russian and Syrian uh, military forces in northern Syria and trying to establish it. All those territories used to be part of the Ottoman Empire. So why compare uh, this current situation to the great game? Well, let's get into that in, in the next slide here. 
All right, so on the on the map on the right, you're going to see uh, uh, basically two depictions of the Ottoman Empire, as, where it got in at its furthest extent in 1683, when it was uh, basically on the outskirts of Vienna and trying to topple Vienna, and then where it was in 1914 at the beginning of uh, World War One. So the time frame of the Great Game is is debated amongst historians. So. Most of them agree it started about the, the beginning to mid part of, of the 1800s. Some people say it ended about 1907, which is when Russia and the United Kingdom came to an agreement on the partitioning of Iran. Uh, I tend to, to think it, it probably went quite a bit further. It probably went to the end of, of uh, World War II, where uh, India got its independence from uh, Great Britain. So the great great game was termed that because it was Great Britain trying to <clears throat> defend its Indian colony from incursions and from uh, protect its trade routes over land and by sea to India. And the main threat that it saw was Russia. But also during this time frame, you have such things as the great uh, scramble for Africa. You also had expansion of uh, the buildup of Germany as a nation, kind of like China is today. You also had a lot of weakness in most of these major powers that you see lifted on the side. So starting at the beginning of the great game, Great Britain had a lot of debt. So they fought two major wars in, in the late 1700s, the Seven Years' War, or French and Indian War, as we call it, which got them control of India. We had the uh, American Revolution, and then we had the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s. We had the Russian Empire that had a lot of uh, instability and fought, I think, 13 total wars with the Ottoman Empire. And then we had France, which had gone through a lot of turmoil, late 1700s, they had the French Revolution, excuse me. <clears throat> and then they had the Napoleonic Wars themselves, where they de were defeated by uh, an allies of the Russian Empire, the Prussians, and the British. They also had a war with, uh, with Prussia, the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, that was a disastrous defeat for the French. Again, we had Germany ascendant. They had, in 1866, they defeated Austria-Hungary, kicking the Austrian Germans out of the German, uh, future German country. And then they turned and uh, provoked a fight with France and uh, defeated France as well, uniting the Catholic and Protestant portions of Germany into one country. At this time frame, also, you have the Ottoman Empire. So they had grown exponentially, as you can see, up to 1683. And that's a rather large and geographically dispersed area to try to control with no Internet and, and no high, uh, high speed uh, forms of travel. And then you also had the autumn, uh, the Austria, Austria, Hungary, which had been uh, reduced by conflict with the, the uh, Ottoman Empire and with its conflicts with uh, with the ascendant Germany. So what all these have in common is, is that the contested area, it mainly lies in where the Ottoman Empire was. And the majority of that population was Muslim. And the Ottoman Sultan claimed leadership of the, the Muslim faith by his control of Mecca and Medina, which was contested during his time. So that became the Muslim population became a very important population in undermining or bolstering one's position when it came to the great game in that time period. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to talk about is what I would call a somewhat successful use of terrorism. So the Ottoman Empire kind of used it a little bit differently than what we have seen most places. They mainly used it for internal control and to manage restive populations. So as we stated before, they had uh, fought their opponents and built a large empire. Well, they, had, they were in competition with the Mamluk uh, Sultanate out of Egypt for control of the Muslim population. Well, they defeated the Mamluks at, at the Battle of Mardabik in Syria in the early 1500s, if I remember correctly, and chased them all the way to Cairo and executed the leader of the, uh, of the, the, the Mamluk Sultanate and then took over control of both Mecca and Medina and claim them, proclaim themselves the leader of the Ummah. Now, the problem was, is they expanded so rapidly, they did not have the infrastructure to be able to administer to those locations. So what they ended up doing was for places like Damascus and Cairo and some of the other towns in modern day Lebanon, they allowed former Mamluk leaders to maintain control as long as they paid uh, taxes annually to uh, Constantinople. But what that also did was, is it meant those local guys had, had no support from the central government. So they were dependent on building their own armies, their own support, and it was easy to contest them. And so what the uh, Ottoman uh, prime, uh, Sublime Port, which was their government, decided to do was pit these rivals against each other to help maintain control. 
And as they, uh, and what ended up happening was, is they traded the leaders for their uh, patronage. They gave them titles of Pasha and Bay and allowed them to collect taxes uh, from the local population as long as they provided a portion, like I said, to the Sublime Port. But one of the most restive areas throughout that time was Egypt. And that was because they did not completely defeat the Mamelukes. A lot of their, those leaders were allowed to stay in place and they were continuing to be restive. They continued to attack each other and conduct terrorist attacks against one another and try to one up each other to gain control of, of that vital area of Egypt. So the way that the, the Ottoman Empire decided to try to handle the situation was they got an individual by the name of <clears throat> Muhammad Ali, who was an Albanian and 6,000 of his troops, and they placed him in Cairo, and they wanted him to put down the Mamelukes. So he did his best, and he gained control. He was able to gain control of uh, Cairo and of Egypt. Once he had that control, the Mamelukes had another issue. They had the Saudi tribe from the, the central deserts of modern-day Saudi Arabia, along with Ibn al-Wahhab, their religious leader, who had taken over uh, Medina and Mecca. And they had no way of deploy, deploying troops because all their official militaries were forced uh, facing off against Austria, Hungary and Russia in the north. And they could not spare those troops for the internal uh, issues they had to deal with. So what ended up happening was is they kept putting pressure on Muhammad Ali to take his army north out of uh, Egypt and to regain control of Mecca and Medina for the Ottoman Empire. Well, Muhammad Ali was a pretty smart guy, and he realized that he could not maintain control of Egypt and march against uh, a, a mobile force in the deserts of what is now Saudi Arabia. So what did he do? For those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, he basically had a red wedding. He invited all the Mameluk leaders over as he anointed his son to go t lead this, this army of Egyptians that were trained by French soldiers uh, and to try to march them north. To, to, for the ceremony. They showed up in their finest dress, and once they got to the, to the location, he locked the door, and his army massacred all of them bloodily. The ones that did not show up fled to the central, uh, to uh, fled south in Egypt and into uh, Sudan to avoid uh, being executed by Muhammad Ali and his men. What this did was it gained him control of Egypt for almost, for almost 100 years. Uh, so his family maintained control of Egypt until uh, Abdul, uh, Gamal Nasser took over in the 1950s. What this also did was convinced him that, hey, the Ottoman uh, Empire is a, is a paper tiger. They can't control this. I might as well march north with French help and knock off the, the uh, caliph and proclaim myself the leader of the Ottoman Empire. What he did not count on was that everybody, all the European powers were considering the Ottoman Empire an important buffer. So as he marched north, defeating the Ottoman armies and all the uh, the bays that were in between him and uh, modern day Turkey, he, the, the, Ally, the Russians, the British and the French started uh, seeing issues with his advance. The French were worried about appearing to be on the side of Muslims against the Christians in uh, modern day Lebanon and Greece. And the British were worried about French having influence over that key area. And the Russians were also worried about being blocked from, from entrance to the Mediterranean Sea. So they all came in to support the Ottoman Empire and stop Muhammad Ali from top, toppling that, uh, that uh, empire. And they forced him to go back to Egypt. So the results of this terrorist, uh, terrorist, this terrorist activity by Muhammad Ali is it helped the Ottoman Empire stagger on for several hundred years, which is why I would call it somewhat successful, because they pitted these groups against each other continuously as their power was waning and influence was waning. It ended up with very little legitimacy within its own borders, and it was constantly on guard uh, from attack from within, as well as from uh, its neighbors of Russia and Austria-Hungary. Okay, next slide, please. So another failed one in the lead up to, to, uh, to World War I and, and towards the end of the great game was the German intent to use terrorism and insurgency. So the main intent was to undermine French influence uh, in North Africa, Russian uh, in, uh, Empire influence in the Caucasus, in England, in India. And the main architect of this was a guy by the name of Maxwell von Oppenheim, who you can see on, on the right. He was a wealthy individual from Germany who had traveled through the Middle East and a proclaimed Arab expert. And some of the things I have read about him states that he was paying for fatwas, religious edicts, to be uh, granted to undermine Russian, British, and uh, French influence. But obviously, it was not to undermine his Austrian allies or Germany in itself. There was even uh, rumors floating around about Kaiser Wilhelm II doing, uh, participating in the Hajj. They would call him, call him Haji Wilhelm. 
he would wear fezes on state uh, meetings with Muslim countries and Muslim religious leaders. So leading up to, uh, to World War One, there was the two Moroccan crises. So the first one was when uh, France was trying to establish its, its uh, further influence into Morocco. And Kaiser Wilhelm showed up in Tangier and proclaimed that he would support the Sultan of Morocco in throwing out the French. And it was meant to undermine French control. So there, subsequent to that, there were some attacks against French troops in, in Morocco trying to undermine that influence. And what his intent was, was to hopefully get the rest of the European powers to come on board and stop France from expanding its influence. And then also gain a little bit more influence for Germany on the world stage as an up and comer. What actually ended up happening was France uh, brought off, bought off Britain and Russia. They held, held their world conference in Spain. And then every single country aligned with France, except for Austria. And it ended up alienate, further alienating Germany, frustrating the Kaiser and, and kind of making him upset and giving him the idea that, hey, I'm not going to back down the next time something happens. And it forced Britain to choose a side which Britain then came on the side of France and also of Russia. So during the second Moroccan crisis, more troops, uh, French troops were marching into Morocco and the German Navy sent a, uh, a ship into uh, the Gulf near Agadir in Morocco to instigate a fight. This one bat almost started World War I. It did not as the, all the countries aligned against Germany, but then also helped to uh, broker a deal which gave Germany some territory in Africa, modern day Cameroon and some other uh, things to kind of buy them off and kind of defuse the situation. But the results of this, of both these actions was Germany, Germany was further isolated. Uh, Germany had to, but Germany had learned some tactics from this that they uh, would employ later on in World War I. So as you can see in the notes there, they had tried to send supplies to uh, Irish uh, revolutionaries during World War I to, to draw the British off the main continent. And they also were instrumental in helping move Vladimir Lenin to Russia to get Russia to pull out of World War I. Next slide, please. So here's a successful one that most a lot of people are familiar with because uh, it was a fairly significant event in the early 1900s. So it's a Serbian use of terrorism. So it was mainly used with some accusations of Russian support and consent by, by the Serbs to kind of uh, force Austria-Hungary to, to focus away from the Balkans. <clears throat> so when Austria-Hungary lost its war with Germany in 1866, they were denied any imperial territory in Europe, uh, in the mainland Europe. So they had to look elsewhere. And the only place where they could ideally spread was down into the Balkans which had Slavic populations that Russia claimed to be the sponsor of and the protector of. And most of that Slavic population happened to be Serbs in, in modern day Bosnia and then also uh, also Serbia at the time. So the individual on the right, Opis, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name. I'm awful at that. That was his code name, was a Serbian intelligence officer and a nationalist. And so he had sought to uh, expel Austria-Hungary from the Balkans. And what he, he wanted as a Serbian nationalist was to expand Serbian control over Serbian uh, populations outside of mainland Serbia and create a Yugoslavia. Sounds familiar. So in 1903, he and his co uh, cohorts went in and violently executed King Alexander and Queen Draga of, Ser of Serbia because he was starting to reach out to the emperor of Austria-Hungary and trying to build friendly relationships with them, which was contrary to his long-term goals. And they placed their own king on, on the uh, throne who was more uh, friendly to their, their goals. The next thing, thing that he did was he assisted a terrorist organization that if you guys read anything about the waves of terrorism was the Black Hand. They were an anarchist terrorist group uh, in the Balkans. And so he assisted them with getting into Bosnia. And they were the ones that actually ex uh, did the assassination on Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie in, in Sarajevo in 1914 which then ended up drawing in all the world powers, activating all these alliances that had been formed previously, mainly due to the Moroccan crisis and other issues that ended up starting World War I. So I called it successful because it ended up, there was a Yugoslavia at some point. Austria was not in charge of it, but it was extremely messy. And uh, there was a lot of unintended consequences in that use of terrorism. Next slide, please. So here's another uh, another failed one that the Germans uh, attempted to use as well. So the year is 1915. Most of the stuff that happened in the beginning year of the war had come into a stalemate. So Germany, as well as most of the other allies, were trying to find ways to break the stalemate. And it wasn't going to be the Western Front. Uh, so what they looked at doing was they, they 
coerced the Ottoman Empire to send emissaries with theirs to Afghanistan. And they went to Kabul to try to buy off the emir of Afghanistan to get him to throw the British out because the British had gained control of Afghan uh, foreign policy because they needed that to protect India against uh, Rus the Russian Empire's expansion. So they wanted to pay him to throw, all, throw the British out and then also to try to incite Muslim revolt within India. In that time, India included parts of Pakistan and areas that were still the Pakistani military and U.S. military are still fighting in today. It did not work because basically what ended up happening was the Viceroy of India just sent even more money across the mountains and into Kabul to, to buy off the, uh, the emir and keep him on their side. So that revolt did not happen. What was the result? After the war, the emir was assassinated, and a lot of the stuff that the Germans and the, the Ottomans had tried to do uh, incite actually took place, and it incited a third uh, Anglo-Afghan war, and Afghanistan actually got its independence, but it descended into, into anarchy and multiple wars over the last 100, 100 or so years. Next slide, please. So here's another one. It's, this one's messy. It's British intent to use terrorism and insurgency. And I would I will uh, argue this is probably one of the more important ones to know, because, again, like most of the other ones before, we're dealing with that, that the uh, what came from this now and we will be for the foreseeable future. So the individual on the right may be familiar to you all that his, he was very famous and probably the most famous military leader in Britain at the outbreak of World War One. His face showed up on pictures with a finger pointing at you and that iconic mustache saying, uh, we want you for the army. The United States actually copied that poster and used it with Uncle Sam for recruiting troops for World War I. But this is Field Marshal Lord Herbert Kitchener. And his importance leading up to World War I and in the great game was he was a, uh, I guess you would call it a colonial soldier. He was part of the British Army, but the British Army was extremely small. It consisted of about six divisions at the outbreak of World War I. To compare, the United States Army right now is 10. So they relied a lot on foreign uh foreign uh, troops from their colonies. Herbert Kitchener was the one who trained the Egyptian army uh, under British uh, officers. They had the same type of thing in India. They had the same type of thing in Nigeria with the King's African rifles. So the intent was to use colonial troops to fight British wars instead of British troops. So at the outbreak of 1914 in the war, he was the consul general in Egypt. And as most countries either tried to undermine the, the uh, sultan of the Ottoman Empire or prop them up, Kitchener, again, because of the interest of, of England and Great Britain, tried to undermine him. So he started reaching out to Arab leaders and trying to create a united Arab identity to help throw off uh, Arab support, uh, support for the Ottoman war effort. As it turns out, his goal in life was he wanted to retire as the viceroy of India, which meant that if he was able to get the Arabs uh, control over the Muslim population and under British auspices, he would probably have a peaceful time as the vice viceroy if he'd gotten that job in India. So as it happens, he was in London when the war broke out in uh, August of 1914. And since he was the most popular military leader at the time, he was named the secretary of state for war. Well, he had already started all this great work as a con consul general of Egypt. And so the work continued on with him uh, pulling the strings from London. So two individuals, uh, two of the key individuals that were used for this were most people are familiar with Lawrence of Arabia. He went and he and some other people from the Arab office in Egypt went and met up with the Hashemites in Saudi Arabia to convince them to uh, stand up the Arab revolt in 1916. Another individual was St. John Philby, who was sent to Ibn Saud to try to convince him to join forces with the Hashemites and also try to throw off the, uh, the yoke of Ottoman control over Arab populations. A lot of why this was done was because of the stalemate at that time. So big picture in 1916 was there was a stalemate, as most people are familiar with, on the Western Front in Europe. Kitchener had long ago decided that it was not worth uh, trying to break through in Europe, and he was try continually trying to find ways to do it elsewhere. So you had the failed Gallipoli campaign, which was trying to attack Turkey directly at Istanbul, and they, lo they ended up pulling troops out in January of 1916 in, in, a, in a failure of uh, the British military there in the, the Australian New Zealand uh, Army Corps. On the Eastern Front, Russia and Germany and Austria-Hungary were almost in a stalemate. There were some advances un under one Russian general in the south, but that ended up dying down due to poor logistics and planning on the side of the Russians. And then on the Italian front in the mountains, most of that had fought into a stalemate as well because it was very treacherous terrain, bad weather. The Italians were, were pretty good at mountain fighting, as were the Austrians, and so they had fought pretty much to a stalemate in northern 
uh, northern Italy and in what is now Slovenia. So what ended up happening is they thought they'd found the weak spot by going after the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman territories in modern day Saudi Arabia and the Levant in an uh, intent to, to use these Arab forces to do that. So what ended up happening was the revolt happened and ended up being uh, somewhat successful. So Edmund Allenby actually wrote them into the plan for the British assault on uh, the Ottoman control of uh, modern day Lebanon modern day Israel and modern day uh, Syria. But a lot of this was gained due to Kitchener making promises that he would uh, support an Arab king with British protection. Well, behind closed doors, the French, the Russians and the English came up with a Sykes-Picot agreement. And that Sykes-Picot agreement said that after the war, they would break up the uh, former Ottoman territories and hit, parse it out to the three powers as repayment for war, uh, war damages caused by those countries. And it was, the intent was to keep that secret and implement it. What ended up happening was the communists, when they overthrew the Russian Empire, saw this and tried to use it to discredit the, uh, the Russian, uh, Russian czar. And so they published it. And for those of you who are familiar with Sykes-Pico, it, it's been used by most Muslim terrorists in modern time as, uh, as a justification for a lot of their actions. Osama bin Laden has mentioned it. Ayman al-Zawahiri has mentioned the Sykes-Pico agreement. So it's kind of uh, synonymous with... Uh, with uh, European and American treachery, even though the Americans were not party to this. this. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, so what we see here is the use of it by nation states to kind of cover up for their weaknesses, either internally or externally, or gain an influence with another one with the intent of not driving major conflict. So we're seeing a lot of the same things today. So the Russians trying to drive discontent and unrest here in the United States with their uh, with their uh, their propaganda and their media attacks and using social media. Uh, you even had Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI, mentioning that homegrown terrorism is one of the biggest threats to America right now, as opposed to foreign born. You have uh, Russia putting the, again, putting the bounties on American uh, soldiers' heads in Afghanistan to try to keep us tied up there so that we can't interfere with other things going on within the nation. And then we had a previous president who wanted to pull back from foreign engagement and uh, have us focus internally. So all of these activities tied together were meant to gain an effect of basically pulling us from the world stage or keeping us tied up where we could not influence uh, uh, or have an impact on what Russia and China are trying to achieve. So thanks again for having me and I'm available for any questions. Thank you so much, Colonel Swedlow, for your talk. Um, that was really informative. Um, we're just going to leave the floor open for any questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please use the um, raise your hand function and yeah. Yeah, Caroline, go ahead. Hi, so I actually had a question. You mentioned the British, um, how they were using colonial troops to fight British wars instead of using British troops. In a way, were they controlling the movements and operations of those colonial troops um, through Britain, or, were, or was there someone on the ground who was like a colonial power doing that instead? That's a good question. So, uh, one of the I'll give you some guys. One of my favorite uh, British officers from from the time period is an example. So, some of these uh, British officers did not have money. So, back uh, in the 1800s and early 1900s, British officers purchased their commission. So, they had to come from money. So, it was usually the firstborn would inherit their parents' titles and lands. The secondborn would be purchased a commission in the military. So, being purchased a commission, you had dues to pay for the mess, which was their dining. You had to buy your uniforms. So, you had so poor officers who could not afford to do that in Britain would do that in the colonial militaries. So, for instance, there's an individual named uh, 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 Horace Smith Dorian, who is a British officer who fought in South Africa. He was in charge of Egyptian troops in Egypt uh, in the modest wars. Uh, and then he ended up taking over British troops in World War I. Most of these, so they would take a white British troop from mainland the United Kingdom and put them in charge of colonial troops. So the King's African Rifles were commanded by a white British officer. The Anzac Corps, the, even the, the White Anzac Corps, the Australian New Zealand Corps was commanded by a British officer. The first non-British officer to command it was an Australian Jewish man by the name of John Monash. And he only got it during the war because he had actually shown some expertise in fighting the Germans on the Western Front. I hope that answers your question. 
Yeah, it does. Thank you. I actually have one. Andy, how do you see, uh, you know, the students have been working on great power competition between the United States and Russia. And th this history is so interesting because, uh, as we always talk about, so many things are just rehashed problems. But how does uh, the UK, Germany, some of these other ally countries of ours see themselves in the great power competition? Or is it not something that, that is even in their calculus? Well, I would say over the last 40 years or so, my personal opinion, I think Great Britain has tried to back down from it. And a lot of it's due to austerity measures imposed in the 1980s. And then they've had a really small military now. And they really don't want to get involved in stuff, as you've seen from them trying to break away from the European Union. Germany has been a little bit more ascendant right now, not necessarily militarily, but they have diplomatically. They, they're kind of what I would call the de facto leader of the European Union. You always see Angela Merkel speaking on, on their behalf and kind of taking leadership of it and doing a lot of the meetings with African and other uh, nations outside of the European Union. So they will be influential. I'm not sure militarily. So militarily speaking, I think we're kind of the lone players, my personal opinion, between Europe and uh, and Russia because of the fact that we have such great capability. And it's really expensive, as you guys know, from the multi-trillion dollar budget the Department of Defense has to be able to deploy troops around the world. Not many countries can actually have that capability. Thank you. Yeah, Brad, go ahead. Uh, thank you for, for coming and speaking to us. Um, I had a question about the, the kind of the historical examples. Uh, from what you were saying, it seems like the only example that was effectively countered by uh, by international efforts was uh, Muhammad Ali's um, march north in the uh, on the ottoman empire um did you find any in in all of your your experience did you find any cases where there was any sort of unilateral uh success in in stopping this uh the the kind of uh, <clears throat> state sponsored state supported uh, efforts to destabilize countries through, through terrorism in that era and what if any uh um what what if what if any they um uh, lines can we draw from that today to, to the current experience? That's a good question. Uh, I'll tell you that part of my uh, research when I was at Naval Postgraduate School was looking at some of these types of things. And one of the, the first examples that comes to my mind is not during this time frame; it's during the 1950s, is the Malaysian crisis. So uh, China was accused of trying to, to sponsor uh, Chinese ethnic Chinese in Malaysia of overthrowing British and throwing the British out of Malaysia. So the British and the Malaysian government actually did a significant amount of reforms in trying to isolate the disaffected population uh, from uh, contact with the Chinese and also giving in to a lot of the grievances that population had. And that ended up ending that crisis and maintaining British control and Malaysian control over that country. That's probably the only one I can think of right now off the top of my head. But the biggest thing I can say is addressing grievances, <clears throat> not shoving them to the side we're trying to violently put them down will will usually uh, help uh, improve the situation and make it harder for a, for an outside power to take advantage of it. I actually have a question as well. Um, so at the beginning of the presentation, you were talking about how Turkey is trying to reassert itself in former Ottoman um, countries. So how do you see Turkey rivaling with like Russia or China in kind of this context of great power competition? That's a good question. Uh, as far as the China one, I can't answer that one. I'm not as <clears throat> familiar with the China, but as far as Russia, it's it's kind of a give and take. Uh, what, I've, what you've noticed is in the news, they've taken Russian anti-aircraft systems, major ones, uh, high tech ones from Russia, but they've also been very confrontational with Russia. So they've supported Islamist groups in Libya against uh, Russian and Egyptian and Saudi backed, uh, I would call secular groups for lack of a better term. And then also in Syria, they actually shot down a, a Russian jet over northern Syria probably almost six, seven years ago now when this was starting to kick off to try to establish their influence over Syria, because that all used to be Ottoman, uh, Ottoman territory. And a lot of what you're seeing, too, also is with the rise of the AKP party. So Mustafa Kemal Ataturk took over Turkey and abolished the Ottoman Empire in 1921 after World War I because he saw the disastrous effects of a religious leadership on that country. So he just established the secular state of Turkey. Well, 
Erdogan, who's the current leader, is part of the AKP party, which is uh, is aligned with, along Muslim Brotherhood lines. So it's an Islamist party. So you see a lot more of an Islamist leading of the uh, Turkish foreign policy nowadays. I hope, it, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah, Jocelyn, go ahead. Thank you for your time today and uh, for for uh, being able to answer our questions as well. Uh, I was just wondering, you briefly mentioned this at the beginning, you, you have the like ubiquity of social media now, it makes it easier and cheaper for state and non-state actors to promote disinformation campaigns. And, you know, often with like Russia as an example, they're not trying to push any one specific narrative necessarily. They can do competing narratives to just try to destabilize. Um, what do you think the future looks like for like, the U.S. combating those kinds of operations? Well, based on the fact I'm retired, <laughs> I can't give you what the U.S. is doing. Uh, but I think Mo and I have talked about this offline a couple of times and some of our uh, stuff. But the, the, one of the biggest things that the United States should increase its funding of is cyber, uh, cybercom and cyber operations. Another thing is special operations. And I'm not talking about the direct uh, direct action, counterterrorism, door kicking stuff. I'm talking like psychological operations, civil affairs, uh, true like Green Beret type of missions uh, going in and working with uh, local populations should become come to the forefront and be better supported monetarily and resource wise uh, to combat this type of stuff. Because uh, uh, as you can see from the stuff before, terrorist attacks and counterterrorism stuff might have delayed it. It would not have stopped World War One. It was going to happen at some point and something like this was going to kick it off. Do you have any more questions? Oh, Leah. Going off on um, kind of the psychological op uh, operations that you were just speaking about, with regard to strategic messaging, when terrorist attacks occur, how can states like the United States try to control the narrative after a terrorist attack occurs to kind of control the perceptions? Uh, so some examples that, that I can think of are, number one, don't paint them as Islamist uh, and, uh, terrorists, paint them as criminals. It's a criminal act under U.S. code. And if you treat it like a criminal, it kind of loses its its power of saying, hey, we're being persecuted for being Muslim, being Islamist or being white nationalist. Hey, you're a criminal. Flat out. You conducted you, you, you murdered somebody, put them through the criminal justice system that way. I will tell you the way Russia has handled it in the past is, as it may not be the right example for the United States and would probably be impractical, impractical for us to do, but they just basically don't cover it in the news. So they've, they've had terrorist attacks. They literally, you'll hear about it happen and then they shut down media and they don't let any of the information get out. So it kind of loses some of its effect of, of terrorizing the population. Yeah, Edward, go ahead. Hey, Andy, it's good to see you again. Um, I'm Ed Cooney. I work at US SOCOM as a defense contractor. One of the things that we've we've kind of seen, I just want to know what your thoughts are, is you know, we pivot from strategic competition or uh, from counter VEO to strategic competition. You know, Biden's new inter uh, interim national security strategy was just published uh, in March. The problem that we see, or that I personally see, is it's okay. We we get the international community on board when we counter VEO. When we talk about strategic competition, it's almost like we're trying to talk to a target audience. Like some of the audience is with us, especially when it's counter Russia. A lot of our European allies, uh, there's no arguing. Uh, you know, try to uh, get united against uh, Russia. But when it comes to China, though, it becomes much more difficult to get the the international community to to kind of side with the U.S. or the other allies. Um, do you see that? And and like, how can we? I mean, I feel like a lot of our international communities are afraid to speak out. You know, the China's like Australia's number one trading partner is China. So like, even our some of our, our Five Eye partners, you know, can't really 
uh, be too vocal and in the messaging piece, information operations uh, on trying to counter China's uh, narrative. I mean, how do you, what are your thoughts on that? Over. Hey, Ed, yeah, it's good to see you again, too. Uh, the first thing I want to point out from your statement also, and I meant to mention this earlier, and it, it, it gives me a, an aside to do this. There was a book written prior to World War One about how uh, the, the Europe could not afford to go to war and would not because of the economic uh, situation. Everybody was making so much money. It was the longest period of peace, and it was unlikely Europe would go to war. And literally, I think it was five years after that book was written, we, you have the, one of the biggest catastrophes of the 20th century happen because everybody thought the economy would play into war and uh, the war not happening. Nobody could afford. Uh, it was bad for business, in other words. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now with China. A lot of the argument is about not confronting China and that China's not going to really militarily confront us because they're making money off of us buying stuff from them. They're propping up our economy. And then, like you mentioned as well, with Australia, one of the examples we had in here was Serbia. And so I think that's also a good example, too. So you had two different uh, terrorist ideologies. You had the uh, office and his Serbian nationalist. Uh, identity, and then you had the black hand that he used to conduct that attack, which was an anarchist, which you would think does not go together. Anarchists are not going to support a nationalist agenda. They had a common short-term goal, and I think that's probably the only way you're going to be able to get people to uh, go after China, because in the long term, they know the money is reliable with coming from China. As a communist country, they can make that decision and stick with it. In the United States, we have the benefit of democracy, but it also puts us at a weakness when it comes uh, to foreign uh, relations and that every four years, potentially, our foreign policy could shift dramatically. And people have used that to their advantage. Africa is a, a key example. And then you also saw it with the Emir in Afghanistan, playing the two sides off each other to get money from them. So I think the best option is trying to find a short term goal for those people that you want to influence to go against China that it aligns with our short-term or long-term influence and try to use that to the best of your, our advantage. If there aren't any more questions, um, we just want to thank you again, Colonel Swedlow, for taking the time to present to us today. Um, and I'll pass this off to Dean Halpin. I'm not sure if you have any last words, but um, thank you again for organizing this event and to Mr. Mirabari, of course. Um, but yeah, we really appreciate the time. I don't have any additional words except thank you for very much for being with us. I'm sorry we had the tech problems at the beginning. Glad we could figure it out and make your presentation work because it was certainly worthwhile. I think our students really appreciated it. Now we'll be able to share it with the rest of our community as well. So thank you so much for being with us. I'm sorry this time we couldn't be in Venice together. That was quite nice, but um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much and guys anytime. Elizabeth Mo, anytime you need it, just ask. Thanks so much. Thank you so much again, Andy. We really appreciate it. No problem.